Welcome back to Turning the Key to Real Estate. I am your host, Nicholas Fegley. We have a special show here for you guys today. One of the first shows of the new season. We are being joined by Don Kiefer, who is the state representative for District 92. How are you today, Don? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for asking. Enjoying this weather. I've got the sliding glass door open and just am listening to the birds chirp. Same here. Absolutely. <laughs> beautiful. It really is. So, Dawn, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, how you got into, you know, politics, um, just background. I felt like government did not see the day-to-day operations of what we have to do in Pennsylvania to start a business and then to sustain and then actually thrive in a small business. And that was my, my reason for, you know, really putting my hat in the ring and saying, you know, I want to go up there and I want to change some things. You know, I think that's a really good reason to take a dive into it because a lot of people who, you know, just go out and shop every single day, they really don't take a thought behind it. And I hear so many people go, oh, I wish I was in business for myself. It would be wonderful to just work for myself. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you do realize it's 24-7, right? (laughs) Right. When you're a business owner. Yeah, it is 24-7. And then you... You got to think too. I mean, I'm talking small businesses, right? So I, my frustration comes in with, you know, my husband has a custom motorcycle business and, um, you know, it's a very small business. It's a niche, you know, industry. And we are the accountant. We're the bookkeeper. We are the floor sweeper, the bike builder, the toilet scrubber, right? We do it all. We can't afford these teams of accountants and attorneys to navigate every new rule that business just throws up ad nauseum. Um, and that's what we started accumulating. The hours we were spending like two hours a week, probably two hours a week. We can't bill to anybody navigating forms for, you know, permitting a piece of equipment or registering it or, you know, submitting taxes or whatever it might be just to comply with government to conduct business. Yeah, that's definitely so true. So, Don, when... I first met you, it was right before this lovely thing you guys all enjoyed, which was redistricting. <laughs> so tell me how that was for you. So for redistricting for me, it did not uh, have a huge impact. I did lose my piece of Cumberland County, which I felt was the best piece. I had Monroe Township. So it was uh, still a lot of farmland there. And um, so that was frustrating. I just went deeper into York, picked up half of Dover Township in there. And, you know, I always called myself prior to this, uh, the redheaded stepchild of York County because I have the northern part of York County. And we are an afterthought for most of York County because our, my constituents, most of them assimilate, they will go to Mechanicsburg to shop or they will go to Harrisburg to shop. Um, some of them, because if they're on the west side, you know, might even go to Hanover um, or Adams County. So we are really on the fringes there. Uh, so that when redistricting came about, um, you know, being the redheaded stepchild, it wasn't like everybody was coveting to get my part of the district. Uh, so I fared out pretty well. I stayed pretty much intact, picked up a borough, which was York Haven Borough, picked up half of Dover Township, and then I lost Monroe Township, which is in Cumberland County. So I'm all in one county now. Which probably makes it a little bit easier now you're not balancing two counties. But um, yeah, I remember and I've heard stories of people that lost districts and are salty and upset. And so I know it wasn't all the way around good. So I'm glad yours was I, at least a good experience. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, it was not that way for a lot of my colleagues. So, you know, I, that's why I want to be grateful uh, yeah. for, you know, how I was, how minimally I was impacted. Yeah. So, Don, what are some of your big um, platforms? What are you really focusing on this year? Um, 
what is it that, you know, you need help with? What, what do the people need to do? So my biggest thing is less government. You know, every time something pops up that doesn't work and this isn't great or, you know, something, someone, you know, uh, services, whatever it may be, our knee-jerk reaction is let's go to the government. And the irony of that is, is that the government seldom does anything effectively or efficiently. But yet we continuously turn to them as if they're the solution to all of our problems when in reality it's called cause probably half of the problems that we have. So it's, it's enabling communities, businesses, people to be self-sustaining, right? To, ha- to give them the power to know what's best for their community. So, you know, we in Pennsylvania, we are uniquely set up, which drives your industry crazy, is all the municipalities, right? Uh, we so have over 3,000, right? 3,000 municipalities. Um, and, and the reasoning for that originally, right, was this local control. But they're willing to cede it at every turn of the uh, of the game, right, or or even county, right? Uh, they'll cede this control. And, and when you get to those le- levels, you are at um, – it's land use, right? So I trust York County and my municipalities for land use. Uh, you know, the state overreaching into that is not going to help. Right. So it's like we got this big in Pennsylvania. We have Pima. Right. That's our emergency management. Uh, They oversee that. But basically all they have done is just collated data from our local municipalities that already know where the biggest issues are. What the value that Pima would have for them would be uh, to collaborate with equipment. Right. That wouldn't make sense for them to buy at that local level, but maybe at a county or regional level that makes sense. Um, So it's it's this self sustainable sustainability of these communities and giving them the tools and resources to do it as opposed to coming through state government who's going to siphon off a layer of that money and then give you less to work with when you could just keep your your money locally and and you know do what you need to do uh, a lot of this under the guise of safety right we these regulations these permits everything you can think of come in and it stifles these businesses we are one of the worst states in the country for economic growth, for businesses. We just are. And that's, that was just recently rated again. I think we're like at the bottom of the 30, uh, 30th percentile as far as starting and sustaining a, be- a business in the Commonwealth. So mine is let's get government out of the way. We, we listed, I forget how many regulations in Pennsylvania during the pandemic. Well, if we didn't need those regulations at a time, uh, that we were in a, you know, a pandemic or an emergency situation. Well, why do we need them now? Mm-hmm. So let's take a look at that. You know, there are some things that, you know, make sense. You you need some, you know, safety practices in there, right? Doctors should be licensed to, to practice, right? But do I need a pharmaceutical tech assistant license? Probably not, right? So it's all this license, all these barriers to the workforce, number one, and then to just starting a business or growing a business in, in Pennsylvania, um, let's get government. Government should not be the obstacle to that for sure. No, that I mean, plus, I mean, it's a tax revenue. So you want, you want that business, you want that business to grow right. so that, it, you know, it's keeping that tax dollars here and stuff. So no, definitely. I, I agree that it's very nice to hear from a state representative that that's the, your main point is less government. Yeah. So right when you're talking about the real estate industry, right, that all impacts your growth. Where where people want to live, mm-hmm. what right, where is it friendly? What has who has good schools, right? And, mm-hmm. and then that kind of that feeds into the tax base. But then your developers the same way. Like I have to discount this parcel of property by this percentage in this district versus the district that I'm adjacent to. Right? So it all plays a role in it. And when Businesses thrive, our communities thrive. Our communities thrive, our schools thrive. So, Don, thinking back, you know, obviously I always tell people there's a reason for something that happened in the world that created XYZ. Where and when did it become so, especially with real estate, so, you know, minuscule? It's so... 
uh, minute about how like, okay, this can't be commercial, but this can be residential and this can't be this. It's got to be that. And like, I get that there's points to certain some of that, but also I feel like some of it is stunting growth, um, especially when we have these giant commercial buildings that all those workers are working from home now that could be converted to apartments because let's be honest, we need that. You know, Mm -hmm. at at what point in time does it, you know, did it get to that point? Why did we get to that point? Do you know? Yeah. So that really, you know, all this land planning, land use planning, right. It was, this was a concept probably in the seventies and eighties, but it really took full force in communities like ours in South Central Pennsylvania, probably in the 90s. And it was a it was a concerted effort um, by the state, pushed down to the counties, um, to have the counties all work with their municipalities to designate uses of land. And this was going to solve all of our problems of the not in my backyard mm-hmm. issues, right? So if I bu- built my house here, well, I don't, I want to make sure that I don't have, a, you know, this big warehouse here, right? Or if I, you know, it, it's all that kind of stuff. And it, it doesn't really matter. Nobody ever wants it in their backyard anyway. They want the revenues. They don't want to pay the taxes, but they, nobody ever wants it in the backyard. So this was the whole, like, we're going to uh, plan our land use. Uh, the thing is, again, you go back to our constitution, land use is local. So that's controlled by your local municipality understand all these, most of these elected officials at that local level, whether it's a borough or a city or a, you know, township, they are usually not paid. I mean, unless you're getting into class one, two cities, you know, your bigger cities, they might be paid, but most of them are, are volunteers at the elected level doing the best that they can with the information they have. And so you have a county coming down to this municipality saying, you guys need to put a land use plan in place and here we've got some guidance for you and here's what you should do let's put all this this kind of development over here this kind of development over here and that's how it kind of that it took root and it continued to evolve and you never really got involved this is a, an apathetic um you know resident right they don't get involved until it's their property or until something's moving in beside them so when the planning phase is out there nobody's saying hey maybe this is or isn't a good idea but, but also understand those things can change. Those maps can change as far as this is industrial, this is agriculture, this is, you know, residential. You can change those lines. You can revisit the plan. Um, that's the nice thing about elected government, right? You can elect somebody else to come in there and let's do another, another plan. Yeah, and I know that there's some people that are working on doing that. Um, it's and not a, it's not a fast course. process. No, <laughs> definitely not. It's not a fast process. And then, and it's not to say they got it right either. I mean, we were dealing with this in, in you know, when we we're trying to sell my grandmother's house, you know, uh, it was this one small area that was carved out that wasn't commercial and she was sitting all around commercial property. So it, it made no sense that, you know, it couldn't be sold as a, a commercial property. Correct, uh, and, yeah. and the amount of money that, you go through, I just had one of my local developers, you know, come and talk to me about the amount of money they spend challenging and appealing decisions of local governments or or planning boards, those kind of uh, entities, and they never get those money back. Even if they win, they don't get their money back. Yeah. So, you know, you're asking, people are shelling out a lot of money. They'll never see again, despite winning, um, is there something that they, that could be done for them? Like, could there be some kind of like loser pay policy oh. that's in there? Now, it might get some of these municipalities to think twice before they are putting in some of these or challenging uh, some of these development plans or you know residential, whatever it may be. Um, having them you know put a little bit more thought into it, but you get the trade associations and they give cookie cutter policy to their different uh, municipalities often. Yeah, and we're seeing that come about right now with short-term rentals and people that are doing Airbnbs. And right now, there's more and more municipalities starting to take a look at them, and they're looking at concepts that truly might not be the best route. So that's a little scary. <laughs> it is scary. And and again, this is not one size fits all. Yep. And and that was part of my issue. Uh, some of our members were trying to bring this in as a state policy. 
uh, let's bring this in and say, this is what has to happen with Airbnb. Well, I'm a free market person. Um, and you, you can do different things. You have, you have numerous tools, local governments do, and even counties do at their disposal already. Uh, so if that community wants, wanted to, right, they could put in, first of all, there, you could be do as a property owner, the restrictions, right? You're selling it to make sure that it's only used for whatever intent, um, that you can do. Local municipalities could put different rental, you know, uh, ordinances in place. So you have some tools there. That way you have local control because it's not one size fits all. And honestly, I think a lot of people do forget that is, you know, they make this blanket policy or blanket ordinance or whatever the situation is. And then we run into now you have to pay for a variance and pay to have the hearing and have all of this extra time and energy by everybody done when, if you just didn't do a blanket policy, it would be a little bit easier. Right. And I honestly think in some of those cases, you get into due process, in my my opinion. Right. So if I want to hear a variant, I've got to pay $500 just to have it considered. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what if I don't have $500? Going back right? to those small so businesses. I, yeah. And so I don't have access to due process. Yep. Like how do you challenge that? I, I don't know how. And, and for what? Uh, another one of them is, right, I, as a property owner, I want to build something. I take it to my engineer. I have it designed by a state-accredited engineer. And then I have to pay my local municipality to review that plan and get their engineer stamp. Why? Mm-hmm. Why am I paying? For, and then I'm paying for that as a taxpayer and as a, you know, a consumer. I, I, there's no reason to do it. I mean, we're paying twice. And if you're already state licensed and accredited, then why do I need to pay someone else to look at it again? Yeah. No, fully understand that. So, Don, what would you say over the next? So last year, I know we got 1031 exchange through. And if I'm not mistaken, you were, you know, a big help in that as well. Correct. Correct. Yep. yep. That was one of our. I my driving your office. Oh <laughs> so uh, yeah. What would you say should be the next thing you would like to see people push for? So the the thing that I've been really pushing them two things at the top of my list. The first is Taxpayer Protection Act, mm-hmm. um, and that just says that state cannot increase spending greater than the three year average of um, consumer pricing index. So you can't increase spending greater than the taxpayer's ability to pay, essentially. So you take a three-year average of the consumer price index, multiply by population growth, and that's your cap. You can't increase spending greater than that. And then that at least controls the growth. It's not a silver bullet, but we start to just start to right-size our budget, right? And if, and if we have a booming economy, right, then that means your your um Consumer price index is going to be up, right? Uh, we have a lot of flexibility with that, but at least gives the taxpayer some kind of security that, you know what, we're not going to have what we just had last year where it was an increase in the budget over 10% that they tried to tell you it was only 2.9. So that's the first. The second one I have is um, the RAINS Act. That's regulations of the executive in need of scrutiny. Just saying, any regulation that's proposed by whatever alphabet soup agency out there, right, that has an impact of $1 million or greater, and that's determined by the independent fiscal office, which is something we have in Pennsylvania, it's a nonpartisan entity, um, has to go through the House and Senate on a concurrent resolution before it can be implemented. That way, you hold your elected official accountable. Because if, you know, Joe Smith in some alphabet soup agency passes a regulation with the help of the independent review, it's called IRC, right? You have no consequences to come back and say, you know, I want to vote him out. He wasn't elected, but he can imp- he can put a regulation in, pay- in place that has a monumental impact on whether it's your home or your business or whatever it may be. Mine just says has a million dollar impact or greater on the Commonwealth has to come through your elected officials, those who were elected into office. So this would be two things that would give, it would give our businesses and families some predictability. 
Yeah, for sure. And predictability helps stimulate growth. Mm -hmm. It really does. And it can bring more businesses in. You know, I think it was what four or five years ago, rumor had it that Amazon was considering (laughs) this area for their main headquarters and then went elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, that's well, they, rumor the, that yeah. I don't have facts. Um, yeah, they were. They okay. were. And we were. We were trying to entice them. So, and this is what we do in Pennsylvania. Instead of just passing some good fiscal policy, and some of these tax reforms that we could do, right? With the, um, we have the corporate net income tax, right? Which we're trying to start targeting to streamline. We did the um, like kind exchanges. We got done last mm-hmm. year with net operating losses. Just some good fiscal tax policy in place, right? And that streamline our regulations, give some predictability. Let's let people practice to the full scope of their license, right? Instead of doing things like that, that benefit everybody, what we do in Pennsylvania is we set up these sweetheart deals for our handpicked few, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon doesn't need our money to come here, Mm -hmm. but we were going to give them it was something like over the course of 30 years, $12 billion or something to relocate here. And there were two different places that they were looking. Um, and, and we were doing everything, but, you know, bending over backwards, but we just could not make it look desirable for them. Even it, even with all the corporate welfare we were ready to put on the line, it still was not, they wouldn't, they weren't going to choose Pennsylvania. Um, infrastructure, workforce, many things in place that just weren't here for them. Mm-hmm. But Despite getting, we had an ideal location. Yeah, but getting more, you know, small businesses rolling, getting better infrastructure set up, you know, better housing, that could have changed things for them choosing here, correct? Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we weren't driving out all these working families, right, these young working families, I mean, that's what's going to grow your your state and your commonwealth. Mm-hmm. Um who could support an Amazon, right? Because when Amazon comes in, they need a lot of local businesses to sustain them. They mm-hmm. need a workforce. They need, you know, maybe it's a rail, maybe it's more more mass transit uh, that you could support and help, you know, fund what's there or strengthen what's there. But we didn't have those that infrastructure in place to make it desirable. So we lose to North Carolina, um, South Carolina. They all eat our lunch. And Maryland is even starting to eat our lunch lately. Um uh, we can do better. We are like, we are geographically ideal in our location in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. We have more education institutions, whether it's trades, whether it's universities, whether it's medical. We have a great network of, of schools and higher education or, you know, tech. We have all of those here, but people come get educated and leave. Our biggest import is old, old people. That's our biggest import in Pennsylvania. Because, you know, we don't, we don't have, um, we don't tax your pension. I know, so we right? import old people and we export our talent. It's, it's not a sustainable equation. It's not. I have right? so many clients uh, that relocate here after they retire just because of that. Yes. Right. Uh, um, and so we're, it's really to our demise that, mm-hmm. that we're allowing that to continue. They lived one place, right? They didn't pay on the front end and then they moved to Pennsylvania and they'll pay on the back end. And then in the meantime, you know, they're getting that break, but then they're mad about the property taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, right. We're just doing, we could do better in Pennsylvania and there's no reason we can't. Uh, it's just that government is not the solution. We need to backpedal some of the things government has put in place, you know, get our permitting uh, and licensing. Let's streamline line that, right? I just, my daughter had to have 1,250 hours to become a cosmetologist. Mm-hmm. Um an EMT person, individual, 250 hours. That's it. Why? It makes, yes, it, it makes no sense. No. <laughs> and, and even in that, That's I mean, backwards. all of that, right. Even all of that training, like she had the 1250 hours, like they make it so difficult. Like she should be able to apprentice and get hours for that, right? That should be time with education, but they can't turn that apprentice into money all, all the time. So, um, again, you know, you, we stifle those who have talents, who have skills that could excel here. Um, we just get in the way. So we need to streamline our le- licensing. And, um, even that, you know, like, right. If you are educated, uh, to a certain level and, and your industry dictates those standards, right? You get accredited license 
why is Pennsylvania saying, yeah, 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 I know you're, you're trained, educated, and, you know, in other states you can do all this, but in Pennsylvania, you can't do it here. Yeah. That, it makes absolutely no sense. Well, so our, we lose our nurses where they can't practice the full scope of their license. Optometrists can't do it. I mean, we have so many areas where, you know, the, the capability is there, but the state stops it. Yeah, I've heard quite a few times growing up through school and everything that Pennsylvania's government thought process is light years behind many other states. Right. Yeah. And a lot of this is self-fulfilling prophecy. So we do have a lot of agencies and, and, you know, bureaucracies in there, right? That, hey, this is just how we've always done it. This is what you have to do. And then, you know, they've learned all the talking points about safety. Um, you know, we have evolved, right? When we know better, we do better. Uh, we need to we can streamline a lot of these processes, the license. Let's let people work. Let's let them provide, right? When they thrive, our commonwealth will thrive. Uh, and stop with these false, uh, narratives about, you know, oh, it's safety and con- consumer protection. It's not. These are not. Uh, to, and even at that, you know, let's say you have been aggrieved by a business. Tell me how the, the government is remedying that. Yeah. So, Dawn. Right, we're not the solution. We're, we're not. I agree. I fully agree. So, Dawn, if people wanted to get behind those two topics that you were talking about are they live bills that are drafted or are they still being put together um the taxpayer protection act is out there again um i'm not sure if that has been introduced it's it's been proposed there's a co-sponsor members memo on that Mm -hmm. but if you go to i think the my website just said right there was again is this the second time (laughs) well for the taxpayer protection act Uh um this is Well, I've been, this is, I'm starting my fourth term. So that's the two year term. So I've been here six years. Uh, That has been introduced three times. Oh my God. We're on our four. Um, Same with my RAIN back. So the regulation in need of scrutiny is there. We get it passed. The Taxpayer Protection Act, we had it passed. It was a constitutional amendment. That way it can't be changed again. It passed the House and Senate. We just had to pass it again. Um, to get it onto the ballot within, you know, it has to be two consecutive sessions. And, you know, that was upended actually by Republicans. Mm. So our leadership wouldn't run that. That's sad. And, and again, that was just saying, you know, you just can't. Last year's inflation, we were at almost 7%, right? So mm-hmm. you could have increased spending by that. Yep. But, I mean, they, they start the narrative early and then all of your uh, local governments and and school districts say, oh, you're tying our hands by controlling the spending. Mm-hmm. Because it's, you know, as a business owner, right, there's another thing that we do in, in government uh, spending, right? We do a cost to carry. Oh, that's just a cost to carry, right? That, that 3%, 4%, 5% increase, that's a cost to carry. Do, do you get that in your own personal budget? How about your even your business budget? Nope. Cost to carry, that's got to get eaten somewhere. I mean, if you don't have the revenue coming in, Somebody's got to pay for it. And usually in a small business, right? Um, I'm just not taking a paycheck this week. Yep. Because I, I, I got to make sure employees are paid. You, you got your payroll, your insurance, right? I'm keeping the lights on. All that gets paid before anybody gets paid a paycheck in the family. Yep. Mm. So, um, but so why shouldn't state be held to the same level? Standard. Yep. Fully. Right? Fully. So just saying you can't spend greater than the taxpayer's ability to pay. No. And, and upping the taxes is not the answer either in case anybody's thinking that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Cause that's not your ability to pay. Right. You, if you didn't get that raise either. Yeah. Right. If you weren't getting raises, raises, um, neither should the government. And then, and listen, I always say like, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Right. You, you could, you could have more money if you, Look at some of these programs that have not been producing, that aren't doing, you know, aren't providing a service. Let's nix that program. Why do we continue to double down on programs that are not, you know, providing a true service or not assisting or aiding the growth of our commonwealth? Well, I think you already answered that question. It's because that's always how we've always done it. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. So you you need some new blood and new ideas in there and, and, and it's accountability. So how can you guys get involved? Accountability. 
know what's going on and then call your legislator and say, hey, this bill's coming up or this, I know this bill's out there. Why isn't it moving? Are you supporting it? We support this bill. Have you asked it to come up for a vote? So they can find that one bill on your site, the www.repkiefer.com. Correct. To be able to get more information on it, I can also link that straight through this podcast. Anybody can click into the bio. Right. You'll be able to click the link and be able to get access right to that. And then, as she just said, call your rep. Have the conversation. Right. Ask, did you support this? If you aren't, why? Get right. that moving. It sounds like it's definitely needed greatly. And yes, and you can go at any point in time when you want to know, like, what. What legislation's out there about, you know, real estate or whatever your issue may be, if you go to it's www.legis.state.pa.us, you can find your legislator there by typing in your address. You can find legislation by a bill number. You can find legislation by a keyword. So you can find a lot of information right there. Awesome. I'll put that link in the bio as well, everybody. So, Don, is there anything else that you really want to share with my listeners about, you know, whether it's, you know, your career, you know, what you're doing next or another bill that you need help getting support on? So, um, as you may or may not know, I am I was newly elected. Pennsylvania started its own Freedom Caucus. Um, and I'm the chair of the Pennsylvania Freedom Caucus. And what that does is um, we essentially, it's not partisan. It's about freedom and liberty. So anything that grows government or takes personal responsibility or personal freedom, infringes on personal liberty, we're your front line. We're your wall on that. And so um, our group is looking, we have a group of 22 across the Commonwealth, and we will aid and assist each other and promote each other on these policies and bills, anything that impacts that wheelhouse, right? And so if it means, like, listen, our block is going to stick together, whether it's a Republican issue or a Democrat issue, um, if it's a freedom issue, we will be there to stop it or to, you know, give it our best shot at it. Um, but I think that's going to give us a little bit more uh, push in the General Assembly, a lot more accountability and transparency, because as we do these things, we're going to do them loudly. We are not sitting here quiet saying, oh, Representative Keeper, I know you don't support that, but could you not speak out publicly about it? Well, we have a, the Freedom Caucus will be speaking out loudly about it. Nice. I like that. Awesome. So that, I think that's huge. I would say that's one of the things that kept me engaged and, uh, you know, made the final push to, hey, let's run another term. But I was getting a little frustrated on, you know, the lack of, of progress and getting things done. And, um, so having that, uh, something new to try and that cohesiveness and having the support behind it, uh, I'm excited that I, I think there's some things that we can do. Maybe we won't realize it, you know, quickly in the first two years, uh, but it's we've, we've got a formidable framework there that's going to definitely have some influence. Yeah, and I think that that's greatly needed. So awesome to know that you are chairing that uh, because I definitely feel we have a good, strong leader doing that. Well, Don, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I definitely want to have you back. Um, especially as you have more things that you might need help with. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. We can get a podcast recorded and out to everybody because sometimes it's just good to hear straight from you than to read it on the paper or see it on social media. Um, and everything, but you know, I know your time is Absolutely. very valuable and I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Sure. The last thing I'll leave you with is, is as an industry, you guys have a, a solid voice, right? Make sure you're utilizing those relationships you already have in your community with your legislators, right? And then when, so when you get to the point where you have something crazy like this shutdown we've had and they wouldn't mm-hmm. even let uh, real estate agents do closings, which I found absurd so that's why i was writing my own keeper waivers but you need to stick together mm-hmm. as that industry as that profession and push back on some of those things um and you use your legislators you, you you will have already had those relationships established right that you can they know who you are 
They know the numbers that you have and they know how the influence you have in your community. You need to use that to your advantage. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, there, there's a lot of agents that I would like to see get more involved. Yeah, and it can start with just one relationship. So if you know that, you know, Representative Bob Smith is good friends with realtor Jane Doe, right? There's a connection you have. You just put that on your list. You're okay. We know who can go talk to that member to, you know, help persuade them where, whatever the policy issue may be. Yeah. But that's sure. going to be how you move, move, move the needle is those personal relationships. And realtors have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship business. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Don. Everybody, My make pleasure. sure you like and subscribe. You don't want to miss out on the rest of the stuff that's going to be coming out on the second season. And as always, I'm your host, Nicholas Fegley. <laughs>